I was terrified, traumatized, because social movement stand against authority. So I am, I don't know, the relationship between you and me. I must say, I stand before you today with uh, genuinely a measure of trepidation. <coughs> because the topic is such that it arouses unmanageable expectations. Whereas I am as uninformed as anyone can be, certainly compared to some of the distinguished members on the other side of the house. What I would like to do, this arrow down and up is to press. What I would like to do in the next about half an hour to 40 minutes is the following. <clears throat> to look at the phenomenon of social movements applying a particular perspective. <clears throat> the phenomenon is quite a massive one with very many dimensions attached to it. I'm sure many speakers are trying to handle some of those aspects. Therefore, my attempt is not to look at social movements in their entirety, in their complexity, no. Not even in terms of their specificity. My intention is not to take up specific social movements and to throw light on the dynamics in terms of their activities, objectives and achievements. I can't do this. What I would like to do is to understand the different forms social movements take, especially the organizational forms the social movements take, particularly at the global level. Again, my, 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 my task, I am quite limiting it for my own convenience to feel comfortable. So, oh, i read it properly. <coughs> so, exploring the purpose, the patterns, and the problems, the organizational forms of the social movements, especially at the global level. It doesn't mean that the organizational forms don't exist at national level, local level, regional level. I'm not getting into that. Next part of my task is to examine the nature of the relationship along with its contextual specificities that exist, relationships existing between the established organizational forms, which I call international organizations, intergovernmental organizations, and the emerging organizational forms, the social movement organizations. I remember 
in the context of the of the travails the discipline of international relations has gone through my own teacher professor rajan characterized the the complicated contentious relationship between international relations and political science in terms of mother in law daughter in law relationship political science not letting the the international relations live grow on its own terms now if you look at the the university system in india in terms of the allowances given to international relations international studies that uh, characterization perhaps uh, mm, those act i would like to conclude at the end of my lecture that despite this hap hazard nature of the relationship between the established and the emerging organized forms social movements continue to find beneficial their association and presence in the established international organizations because there is no better vehicle available to the social movements to pursue their own agenda <clears throat> professor sani the other day had started off um, uh, in a very remarkable way uh, identifying various problem areas uh, in the international relations discipline vis-a-vis -vis social movements taking advantage of that background i would like to briefly touch upon the international relations perspectives on social movements social movements refer to loose mass based associations which aim to bring about or alternatively oppose change in a specific issue area through sustained public activities like protests marches and so on and so forth in the dominant state centric international relations discipline social movements are seen as a source of problem as a problem to the imperatives of maintaining the existing order instead of looking at social movements as entities holding the key for finding constructive long term solutions to some of the key problems such as globalization democratic legitimacy economic justice ethics of governance and so on and so forth the approach of international relations scholars to social movements can be characterized along three broad orientations i am using slightly different uh, terminologies uh, but uh, basically capturing the essence of the points made by professor sani the other day the first one is the pragmatic orientation looking at the social movements as partners basically flowing from liberal approach to international relations in order to understand problems of the system and and search for solutions in a sense of partnership in other words the social movements like non state actors become become stakeholders in the system maintenance as contrasted from the structuralist orientation where formal aspects of participants become less important and more attention is given to the structures processes explaining the role of various actors and third is what is called transformative orientation which is emancipatory which can be captured under the critical 
schools of theory in international relations. Basically, again, highlighting some of the fault lines involving the role of social movements uh, along the dichotomy such as the social movements versus transnational social movement organizations, oligarchy versus democracy, local versus global, and so forth. I will not get into these details because that is not the focus of my presentation. Often, social movements are, in international relations discourse, unlike the situation in very many social science disciplines like sociology, political science, they are subsumed as part of the other familiar corporate entities, collective phenomena like civil society, even non-governmental organizations, and so on and so forth, which would encompass, among other things, media, non-governmental organizations, spiritual organizations, and so on and so forth. Now, the main part of my lecture, which is look at movements, social movements as organizations. The tendency as Professor Uman points out in one of his recent essays, uh, to look at movements as institutions in mutually antagonistic, exclusive terms is not only uh, unhelpful, if not obsolete. In other words, sociologists would look at strong linkages in the trajectory of evolution of social movements in becoming specific formal entities which we can call organizations. In some of the sub-branches branches of international relations, uh, organizations, institutions are used uh, um, synonymously, though some theoretical strands would like to differentiate. I will not get into that aspect because my purpose here today is not to complicate the subject matter before us. Just like the point is the 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 merit in looking at or making the case for institutionalization of social movements which are originally in a very diffused, decentralized, informal fashion. Just like sovereign state has become an institution in itself, there are very many other examples uh, in the arena of world politics. It is possible for social movements to be conceptualized as institutions for realization of their goal to work for the desired or to resist, as I mentioned already, undesirable social change in political order. So institution, institutionalization becomes an essential tool for social movements, according to sociologists, uh, which I go along with, a, an essential tool for goal fulfillment of uh, social movements at different levels. There is an interesting example. Many of us have heard about the role international campaign for banning landmines, which started as an umbrella group, as a movement, um, encompassing hundreds of entities, local, uh, national, non-official entities, including some, some, some uh, encouragement from Western governments. And this campaign for ICBL, uh, when it got the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997, it was not in a position to receive the check about a million dollar money because he did not have a bank account. And the bank account, as you all know, cannot be opened without address proof and office, you know, uh, and other uh, requirements. ICBL had to become an institution, an organization, in order to make a point on the global scene and more effectively pursue its uh, goals. So mobilization and institutionalization are two faces underlining the dialectical nature of the relationship these social movements have 
with their environment. There is organization theory in sociology, which we are fond of uh, applying to the study of international organizations, wherein the environmental you know, organizational sociology brings in the role of environment, the structural dimensions and tools, technologies and so on and so forth. So mobilization, institutionalization are intertwined in the historical processes and evolution of uh, social movements. Social movements vary in the extent to which they adopt formal bureaucratic structures. Organization means necessarily, according to um, um, the dominant school of organization scholars in the field of international organization, whether Michael Barnett, Martha Finamor, and so on and so forth, uh, organizations are translated for convenience in order to look deep into the organizations, a set of bureaucracies which have interests of their own, just as states have, just as governments have bureaucracies. So uh, there are varying uh, varieties of social movement organizations when social movements become institutions. Greenpeace is, for example, at, the, at, at one end of the spectrum with about uh, Mm, 43 offices across the world. They started in Canada many, many years ago, maybe in 1970s, and uh, thousands of, thousands of followers uh, uh, as supporters. And uh, in fact, my information says that five million supporters and a thousand paid employees, as opposed to the, at the other end of the spectrum, very informal, loose organization uh, example, global action, people's global action, which is anti-globalization movement working as a network. So now I'm having made some observations about, uh, uh, about social movements as organizations. Let me move to a specific form of social movement organizations which is the transnational form of SMOs, social movement organizations. As I said, my purpose is just to look at that singular specific aspect of social movements, which is at the global level, how they operate as organizations. In uh, short abbreviation, any study of international organization cannot be contemplated, cannot be even conceived without any abbreviations. My, Students in an MPhil MA class uh, are made more than familiar with this uh, hazards of handling changes in the organization. Oh, I must rush to Bonton immediately. Changes in the organization of state and society and challenges and opportunities associated with globalization have contributed to proliferation and professionalization of social movement organizations. Uh, at the global level, there are opportunities to campaign, to gain visibility, uh, uh, and to gain sympathizers, and so on and so forth. SMOs and their transnational counterparts have become actors in their own right in various fields of interest, whether it is peace and nuclear disarmament, environment. Just now we have uh, viewed a film which shows the environmental concerns of local community in Durban in, 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 in uh, South Africa. Uh, trade, labor, and so on and so forth. As governments increasingly turn to global institutions to mitigate problems, social movements also cannot be left behind. They cannot afford to, to lag behind. Social movements also seek to change local and national practices by becoming transnational in the interest of better socialization, communication, shared interests, and burden sharing whether it is in the case of human rights, environment, economic justice, and so on and so forth. The emergence of new social media, 
we have all seen the role of Facebook and uh, internet along with advances in international information communication technology enable this transnationalization process of social movement organizations. Social movements need to ensure cross-cultural communication. No, when, when they seek to operate at the global transnational level, there are obstacles, there are operational problems which need to be overcome, including the imperative of communicating with set of people who don't come from the same cultural, historical uh, background. So, cross-cultural communication and manage geographical, political differences, diversities in order to further a shared agenda. Now, I wish to uh, talk about some of the uh, 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 empirical tapestry of transnational social movement organizations. I have come across, I must say this, I should have said it at outset, whatever I am saying today is not original. Okay. Thanks to the organizers of this lecture, under chapter 7, I was forced to read on social movements and I'm very happy, you know, the need is a mother of uh, invention, uh, not only in our practical day-to-day -day life but even intellectual pursuits. So I have happened to read some of the very, very exciting, interesting, I hope uh, I'll make use of these, uh, these experiences in the days to come, uh, prior to our post-retirement days. Who, you know, scholars, <laughs> Uh, Jackie Smith, you know, there is a book on uh, social movements and uh, organization theory, you know. I, I, I wanted to read the whole book from cover to cover, but some aspects I thought are irrelevant in this. There is, uh, in some aspects it's a disappointment to me, uh, that is Gerald Davis and others edited. S uh, Smith, in that book, analyzed relevant data for the period 1972 to 2000. Data uh, highlighting some of the patterns and trends in the growth of transnational social movements, movement organizations. I, I would like to spend a few minutes on this aspect just to, to underline uh, the importance of this phenomenon as part of, integral part of the larger phenomenon of social movement organizations and social movements at large. <coughs> the overall number of transnational TSMOs had increased during this three decade span from 1970 to 2000, fivefold, from 200 to 1000. The TSM was, I hope you are looking at this uh, slide, otherwise my one day labor. <laughs> TSM was, uh, there, there is a dissection, field-wise dissection in terms of the focus of the activities of these 1000 uh, TSM was. Human rights area, remains one of the prominent areas of concern of transnational uh, SMOs. So much so that they, they have consistently constituted 25%, say, if they were about uh, 47 in 1970, they, uh, they were about 241. If I remember right, I don't know whether I have these figures in 2000. So, I mean, uh, correspondingly there, is, there should have been increase in 2010 or 11. While there is rapid increase in the newer areas like environment and economic justice and rapid, that's a very dramatic, sharp, upward increase from 17 in number to 167 uh, 
in in environment and economic economic justice means basically anti globalization protests against uh, economic liberalization and so forth so the dramatic growth however in the number of and there is one more dimension which is single issue tsmos as compared to the multi issue tsmos now single issue whether it's a trade unions or human rights now that is a little outmoded trend the latest trend is multi issue tsmos basically accompanied by with the persistent concerns about the development problems in the global south and problems in the global north also uh, in the light of the recent uh, economic recession so human rights development economic uh, and environment economic development and en environment and so on this kind of multi issue tsmos had grown from 7% to 17% from 18 to 167 there is one more dimension which i think is a matter of uh, interest to us in this part of the world which is north south polarization in this uh, demographic scenario of tsm boss the where does south figure and uh, what is the 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 situation as regards the north 64% of tsm boss are organized based on global north and south interdependencies interconnections 64% of the 2000 2000 is my 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 reference point however this trend does not diminish the rest of the tsm boss with exclusive character of membership exclusive i mean tsm boss with members hailing only from global north and also tsm boss likewise uh, with membership only from global south and and so there is some kind of uh, 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 of uh, clumsy coexistence between the the north south combined tsm boss and north south exclusive tsm boss it reflects this latter pattern of the separate existence reflects key conflicts at work in the global political economy as each group focuses on select is east means north uh, south select issues of human rights human rights whether civil political over uh, overriding the the importance of economic social therefore north south divide comes up environment protection and economic justice need of industrialization and so on and so forth even if it points to north south polarization the pattern also could indicate the bridging it's on the one hand there is a divide north south but there is also a fact of intra south divide and so the tsm boss in south from south have a dual task to address which is to manage the propensity of the global north tsm boss in dictating terms to the global south tsm boss on the one hand and on the other hand global south tsm boss have to paper over the problems of divergent interest uh within the uh global south the last aspect of this uh, tsm boss statistical data which is the organizational structure of the transnational social movement organizations i have already made reference to two examples the greenpeace international and uh, the global people's action the tsm boss have traditionally adopted federated structures where national chapters get some affiliation to the international secretariat and headquarters and they get also some subventions which means subsidies financial support from from the national headquarters this situation has undergone 
uh, I won't say dramatic change, but uh, but a very interesting change. The share of T T S M was not T N S M was with the federated structure sharply declined from 50% in 1970 again to 18% in 2000, giving space, more and more space to loosely structured TSMOs, which I would call the, the coalitional structures of transnational social movement organizations. This figure is 25% in 1970 to 60% a decade ago, from a stage where they received heavy financial support. And one of the interesting ramifications of this uh, phenomenon in the making is the increasing autonomy national chapters, whether it is Oxfam India, WWF India, where the national chapters have gained the capabilities and skills to generate resources on their own, identify priorities of their own, and then launch campaigns according to their priorities, which means greater degree of functional autonomy and loose linkages with the headquarters, international secretariats. In short, TSLOs have become coalitional in their structure in the sense that they are more decentralized and less hierarchical. So, in other words, the organizational form of social movement organizations would imply that bureaucratization and celebrating a sort of hierarchical arrangement of decision making. But now, because of this uh, innovative organizational structure which is in the making, that hierarchical type of TSMOs is being blunted. You know, I have made already reference to hierarchic, oligarchic versus democratic uh, orientation. Uh, uh, or fault line in the theoretical uh, approaches to social movements. In this model, national affiliates, as I mentioned, enjoy greater autonomy as part of larger network. I will just come to this concept of network. World Social Forum can stand as one of the most prominent examples of this coalitional organizational form where about 60,000 plus uh, entities were brought under one single umbrella on a regular annual basis. Now, social movements and organizations, that's the next step in my, in my mm, mm, drone attacks. Mm. The social movement scholars categorize civil society campaigns and networks. I am referring to the work of uh, Keck and Sikink, 1998, according to the differences in their approaches to international organizations. So I am slightly shifting the ground from civil society per se for my own convenience and also to please my own discipline, which is IR. Uh, area. Mm. So, in terms of social movements and their approaches to international organizations, on the one hand, some human rights social movements support the efforts of international organizations. They want international organizations to make norms, rules, just like human today, uh, when yesterday the arms trade treaty was adopted, human rights organizations had lauded that development. Whereas some states have been, like uh, uh, Indian uh, permanent representative at Geneva, speaking in New York, had expressed some reservations. So human rights, uh, transnational social movements have a sense of empathy to international organizations. They want them to be more active, assertive in laying down norms, rules, and regimes. Whereas relatively, uh, I know there is a mention about the World Bank, a critical mention about it, but uh, uh, there are may, very many shares in the approaches to the world, uh, to the international organizations. Uh, uh, on the one hand, there is UN system, which is more, relatively speaking, tolerant, 
And on, at the other end of the extreme, World Trade Organization, International Monetary Fund, somewhere in between, maybe close to the World Bank, or to the fund and the WTO, World Bank does make some pretenses, appearances of accommodating some of the local voices. A mention has been made about uh, the conflict between the corporate interest and the interest of the local <coughs> communities and so on and so forth. But when you have a more uh, overarching understanding of the dynamics in the relationship between the social movements and international organizations, perhaps the World Bank falls somewhere in between the two camps. Seeking in an essay uh, recently, recently means uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> Because my data ended with 2000, so 2003 is updated. Uh, but uh, there is a very conceptual uh, 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 insight into this, into the dynamics of relationships between the social movements and international organizations, especially bringing in law. I know Professor Chimney will be speaking in a way on law, but this is a very interesting intervention in the literature. Sikkim develops a typology of roles of social movements in international institutions. I will just highlight two types of roles social movements have come to play in institutions. Again, institutions, law, scholarship uses institutions, organizations interchangeably. Conceptual role, first, is in terms of calling attention to, highlighting some of the issues, raven, solid-based, <coughs> Uh, dump yard and so on and so forth, or create, uh, calling attention to existing ones or raising new issues, whether it is small arms, cluster bombs, capital punishment and so on and so forth. Two, promotional role, I will call that loosely promotional role in terms of providing information to the governmental actors, non-governmental actors, publicizing the decisions, uh, for, I'm sure, uh, the Amnesty International, ICRC, will, uh, will print the copies of the arms trade treaty and distribute. So campaigns, publicity campaigns, uh, are, uh, fall under the, under the head of promotional. Uh, and also lobbying among I mean, governments, uh, uh, what is happening in terms of the capital punishment, and, uh, uh, death penalty, debt relief. There is one transnational social movement which is Jubilee 2000 which had campaigned, in fact raised the issue of external debt and uh, unbearable burden it was causing in Africa and least developed countries, as a result of which this HIPC initiative was launched and so on and so forth. The opportunity structures were social movements in international organizations. This concept is prevalent to uh, in the social science discourse. Uh, national social movements work in very different political contexts uh, which can be characterized in dualistic fashion, either tolerant or repressive. In Latin American countries, for example, there were times when repressive regimes were ruling the roost. So similarly, I was also, so social movements role domestically can be related to the nature of the role and the approach of the regime to the social movements, whether it is open or repressive. Similarly, some IOs are more open to social movements. Example, again, I would cite uh, my favorite organization, the, the, the UN human rights bodies, human rights uh, treaty bodies. For example, there is a body on the Convention on Child Rights. That is the most liberal uh, mechanism that gives voice to any and every uh, every voice that wants to be heard. Whereas on the other extreme, of course, within the UN system itself, there are so many shades. The there is a mechanism meant for for the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against the women. That is one of the most restrictive mechanisms, denying voice to the women groups. Uh, uh, so having said, again, uh, uh, in a very general fashion, the UN is more open and tolerant to 
the role of social movement organizations, while others, the ones which I already mentioned, W2MF, are less open to labor and environmental groups and activists. Based on the SM experiences in Chile and Argentina, the tactics adopted in IOs include boomerang tactic. This is the typical term used by uh, Siking in his 2003 article, which is if a regime is repressive in, within the country, then the social movements have turned to international organizations and found allies in those international organizations. Then the sympathy, support gained in international organizations could be made to boomerang against their own national governments and regimes. Conversely, social movements find international organizations also sometimes closed when domestic regimes are open, especially in terms of the policies towards globalization, liberalization, and so on and so forth. So the role, opportunity structures for social movements in international organizations are again different and they are dynamic. They change from organization to organization, from issue to issue, from time to time. In about next five minutes or so, I will, uh, I will end this, uh, this lecture. This is about the UN civil society social movements relationships. Uh, we have talked about international organizations after talking about transnational social movement organizations. Now I'm coming to the UN civil society relationship. The UN approach to civil society and social media is highly enigmatic. The UN bureaucracy, especially, in addition to the member governments, you should look at the official statement by Indian ministerial delegate when uh, Cardozo panel report was submitted, uh, made loud uh, noises, long noises about uh, showing the reservations about uh, the, the problems with civil society roles in the international arena. So the UN approach to civil society and social movements is highly enigmatic. On the one hand, SMs are feared because they threaten, as I mentioned already in one of my preliminary observations, established basis and forms of international interaction. On the other hand, they need to be courted by international organizations, by the UN bureaucracy, since the values they defend, this has happened in the case of disarmament matters, in the case of climate change, and so on and so forth. The values they defend, the energy they demonstrate, and the capacity, their capacity to mobilize the youth seem to be useful for the revitalization because many international organizations, including especially the United Nations, face the dilemma of, of uh, plugging the democratic deficit. So in the quest to do something to make them more democratic, linkages with social movements and non-state actors is deemed essential. Uh, notable is the fact that the UN, of course, there is one more thing, uh, which is there is a extant system which is still evolutionary in character, is uh, uh, the, the, the structured relationship between the UN and civil society groups in terms of the graduated consultative status system class A, class 2, class 3, which has uh, percolated down to various other sub-wings of the United Nations system, whether it is UNESCO, WHO, FAO, and so on and so forth. So there are about 3,000 uh, non-state transnational actors which are associated with the uh, Department of Information, Public Information, ECOSOC, Economic Social Council and so on and so forth. Apart from this, uh, the global conferences, just now the film had mentioned uh, Johannesburg had been uh, a venue for large-scale presence of not only governmental negotiators, but also non-state actors. According to some statistics, 
about not 20,000. In Rio, it is actually 1,400. I stand corrected. I thought I have corrected uh, in my pen drive, but technology is insurmountable to me. Uh, at, uh, Johannesburg, that figure has shot up 10 years later to about 30,000. Uh, uh, non-state entities. So uh, in the era of globalization, there is this uh, spurring of social movements. Uh, somebody has used this very interesting word, social movements spur international activity and also spur international activity which is not liked by them. Though the spurring process and the spurning process is uh, goes on on a parallel uh, track. Indeed, in the 1990s, uh, um, the fact that there is an interesting dimension which I, am, I, I want to share with full enthusiasm. A student of ours is doing PhD on this aspect, joint UN program on uh, HIV AIDS. Uh, Rajiv Ranjan, I don't know whether he is here, otherwise Khabardar. <laughs> 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 The UN AIDS is unique in one single, singular aspect, which is it accommodates representatives of beneficiaries. The point that is made about the local communities uh, in that film, benef representatives of beneficiaries of various interventions on, the, on behalf of HIV AIDS in its governing board and is unlikely to make an impact on uh, other it doesn't mean that it becomes a precedent for other organizations. Each organization has its own ego, has its own uh, unique profile which it wants to protect, which is characterized as organizational pathology <coughs> by, by scholarship. So, winning greater access, relatively speaking, greater access at the UN for social movement actors would then be uh, let me read here. Uh, greater access at the UN would then be less meaningful if the UN capacity were to address hard economic issues. So uh, the social movements may not find very, very exciting to have symbolic presence and representation unless the substantive concerns are addressed by the community of international organizations. There is a flip side to the organizational. Uh, uh, form. Uh, if I have given you an impression that organizational form is the most desirable, ideal destination for social movements, I think I, 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 I'm exaggerating the case. There is some disadvantage to, to the organizational forms social movements take in the sense, for example, uh, slowing of decisions decision-making procedures are important, uh, and uh, um, routinization of practices. All these, you know, bureaucratized, bureaucratized patterns and tendencies will militate against the very nature intent of social movements. Having said that, I would like to make two-fold concluding observations at the end. I think this is my penultimate slide. International organizations will continue to be state controlled as they have been. I mean international governmental organizations, I would say also <coughs> by sticking my neck out, many international non-governmental organizations, whether in the Global South or Global North, are also uh, front offices for, for promoting, protecting governmental interests. International organizations will continue to be state controlled that explains the widespread resistance to the Cardozo panel in 2004, which came out with a recommendation for institutionalizing in a very big way, including at the level of the General Assembly, uh, of uh, active, sustained relationship and participation of civil society actors in the deliberations at least, if not the decision making at that apex level. As I mentioned, uh, many, Many northern and southern governments joined hands in uh, dousing uh, sumptuous amount of cold water on that 
part of the report. Even so, my conclusion is, even in the face of this not, not very, very happy, if not disconcerting scenario, the transnational social activists could continue to turn to the UN and other international organizations to engage in lobbying, networking, and alliance building, and from time to time to put together successful global, national, local coalitions. That is the end. Thank you. My name is Ramanujam. I'm an Impel student. Uh, during your lecture, sir, you mentioned uh, some of the transnational social movements. They represent every voice. Uh, I am of the uh, view that some of the uh, transnational movements, they don't represent the real people the, who are affected by the issues. They speak on behalf of them. Just example, I'm giving the use, uh, white man speaking about the black man's issues. I mean, you don't represent the issues get affected by. And the second one, second question is the trans uh, organizational pathologies. So these transnational movements, when they become organizations, the issue get even solved. But organizations fights for survival to make relevant to the issues. So I have. I want to clarify to Mother Meher first. Nice question. Nice to hear you. Because you felt nice to hear me. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, social movements cannot be profit. I think it will be grave injustice to bracket them together with uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, IBM, transnational for-profit business organizations. Uh, but uh, your concern, I would uh, take it back to, I think uh, Ramanujam has raised this. I think uh, whether in regard to, especially when social movements are in a pre-institutionalized form, uh, there is scope to feel that there is less of transparency and public control in terms of ensuring accountability, effective accountability which is an argument applicable equally forcefully to international organizations also. I'm not talking. So, my perspective, I propose, is that to make them more transparent than what they are, the bottom of the answers possibly is institutionalization and organization, so that there is scrutiny. As I said, bank accounts, no, no bank accounts, nobody can escape from RBA scrutiny, and so on and so forth. So, in other words, in the interest of transparency and some modicum of democratic accountability, organization, even at the cost of delaying the decision-making processes which might otherwise be efficient. Uh, 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 my submission is organizational form 
he is a step in the direction of helping them social movements become more effective as i said in their goal fulfillment so what about social movements not yet institutionalized world social forum it all depends on how you define institutionalization i define in a simple way institutionalization in terms of regularity of interaction if something hrdayanath kundru memorial lecture has has hold the opinion that it is institutionalization of the interaction in the sense that it is every year whether it is april or october whatever it is there is roughly regularity built into world social forum with one or two exceptions it is a regular feature it may be chaotic one but it is institutional it may not be properly organized yes but it is institutionalized so institutionalization is a process whereas organization i'm not i'm not talking about organized social somebody has said about the organized social movements and social movement organizations so uh, institutionalization speaks of the process of regularizing contact and communication interaction world social forum i, I don't call this you know, uh, non institutionalized institutionalized one day can uh, i can give you uh a little more traditional example not to do with the kind of social movements but state movements non aligned movement uh avoiding organizational forms it has embraced institutional forms mm, uh in a way foreign ministers meetings happen those secretaries shifts from one uh host to another and so on and so forth so institutionalization is uh, a, a, an introductory elementary preliminary phase of the organized social movements as far as the distinction between the organized social movements and social movement organizations uh perhaps there is something more than semantic uh, in this uh whether you want to emphasize on movements or the 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 organizational preeminence in the movement overriding bypassing the the uh, flexibilities fluctuations inherent in a movement so i i would submit uh, as a brief uh, tentative answer that there is a, a substantial difference between now uh, for example organized cooperation uh organized uh, you know uh, interaction in in world political scenario has different from various organizations that stand for interaction so in other words there is a systematization there is a science involved in that and here there is a um, organized social movements there is some imprecision abstractness associated with it mm yes that's why i did answer tsm goes i never said it speaks for everyone but uh, there is this this uh, contradiction private and public in that you know uh, something which may be public to a section of protagonists it may be private to others so uh my if you remember my definition i have flagged one one significant dimension of social movements which is a given issue area it is not all encompassing concerns of social movements a given issue area whether it is human rights again there are so many perspectives on that and that uh, not everyone can be taken on board 
And again, everyone doesn't mean it, as I said, you know, within the world of social movements, organizations, the, the north-based social movement organizations have greater privileges in participating and showing up in international conclaves. I am sure it had happened in Johannesburg, everywhere else, as compared to because travel expenses, and hotel expenses, and so on and so forth. So, the financial wherewithal is a problem. And, but the, the northern social movement organizations claim to speak for everyone. And they, they pretend to, to guide, steer the thinking processes of the rest of uh, the, the, the non-governmental forum. Social movements close to governments, Indian scenario. Surely India is one of the very conservative voices on allowing. There we are democracy, domestically we do. But as far as the foreign, you know, voices are concerned, whether it is human rights or development or elsewhere, nuclear energy of late, we are uh, Mm, somewhat sensitive about their role, but it doesn't mean, I think uh, Red Cross, like an Indian Red Cross movement, they are extension of the government scheme of things. The President of India heads that, the ex officio uh, chair of India. And, uh, government money goes into this. There are social movements, social movements which are which are extensions of governments. Uh, and I don't problematize that just for the fun of it, uh, provided social movements are doing what they have promised to do in a proper fashion rather than becoming uh, a sham in a sense. Uh, Last point, someone has raised the status quoism of institutions and organizations. Uh, I want to be emphatic in stating, which I have not stated in my intervention. International organizations, uh, they, are, they are double faced. They show one face to states. Thomas Weiss talks about three United Nations, the Trimurtis, uh, not the M U R T H Y, but uh, uh, three Murtis of United Nations. Uh, one United Nations, United Nations of governments, for governments, run by governments. The other United Nations, actually, the, the behind the scene. Mm, officials who offer leadership, who draft packages, solutions, uh, and so forth. The second United Nations, second house, the third house, the third United Nations, which is civil society reaching out to people, and uh, and so on and so forth. So, but, but here, uh, uh, the first United Nations is conservative. They want to assure. They want to be. Uh, trusted servant of states. Look, we want to serve you better, but if we want to serve you better, give us more tools, more powers. They petition to governments. To that extent, I have no problem in saying that their, their heart lies in convincing states that they are dependable status quo tools for flowing from reality. But on the other hand, at the same time, yeah, it's like uh, squaring the circle of the system of states. In other words, they would, in a very subtle, uh, subversive fashion, if I may say so, in a subversive fashion, they are engaged eternally in the project of systemic change, peaceful change, not uh, violent change. So, to that extent, they 
assure on the one hand that we are here for order, but they also work in partnership with civil society actors for organized change in the system. To that extent, there is a shared agenda between international organizations on the one hand and social movement organizations on the other hand. There lies the potential for partnership between not status quoist partnership, but uh, I won't say anti-status quoist, but non-status quoist, to put it in minimal terms, non-status quoist uh, partnership between these two sets of actors. Next round. Do you want to ask? I'm sorry, we'll have to close. But why say should not be so? <laughs> <laughs> Last question. What happened? I think uh, it uh, is a testimony to the dynamics of interaction of human rights movements in, in international fora, which has culminated in the, the, the arrest and then uh, subsequent Subsequently, he was brought back to Chile and put under trial. In fact, this is cited as one of the outcomes of the role of social movement organizations in the field of human rights. Um, there are various other developments, you know. UK became a party to Rome Statute and there are some obligations um, and so on and so forth. So I, I thank you for that, uh, that uh, elucidation of uh, the story of Chilean um, military leader. Uh, yes, Professor Negi has talked about uh, NGOs, social movements. You know, the, it is increasingly the, the unfortunate fact of life is that it is increasingly hierarchical. Whether in terms of, with reference to states, it is hierarchy. States and NGOs, hierarchy. Within NGOs, as I pointed out, hierarchy. And NGOs, social movements, it's like, you know, railway compartment. You know. And so long, till I get into the railway compartment, I fight. It's like father, son again, you know. We change our sides, when, from child to father, then our uh, case changes. So here, social movements are at the lowest uh, bottom of this ladder, hierarchical ladder. And uh, the only point here is to the advantage of social movements is that they can shout. And times now wants those noises. Social media wants social movements. And social movements are making use, like you know, ask Arvind Kedriwal, he gets a lot of time uh, on channels. Everyone who wants to Say whatever, you know, relevant or irrelevant, sensible or otherwise. So social, thanks to social media, social movements have gained more visibility. Not only visibility, but they are successfully dramatizing their case. And thanks to social media, this is mutual, you know, dependency syndrome. Thanks to the social movement. The social media, especially visual media, and even social media, they are flourishing, prospering. So, uh, it is a historical coincidence, and uh, the contemporary situation is a remarkable uh, mirror of that coincidence. Uh, 
political geography friend has asked about the geographical particularities ignored by T.S. Ambos. I mean, I, at least in a rhetorical way, I did uh, claim that T.S. Ambos have a challenge of overcoming the diverse voices and interests, which include not just cultural, political, but also geographical, whether in terms of climate change and so on and so forth. I, 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 I have not claimed that TSMOs are a panacea for all kinds of uh, contradictions around us in the world. I, I have not claimed that. But what I have said is that TSMOs can be a value addition in searching for because many of our problems are common. And therefore, when we put heads together, uh, that process is helpful in learning from each other's experiences, perspectives, uh, and especially in the era of geography, to do apologies to experts uh, in geography field, uh, the, the globalization of experiences and the, the conviction that the, the sharing of ideas will will overcome the rigidities of geographical divides. So in other words, I am not saying in short that they are a solution to or they are an alternative to geographical particularities, but uh, possibly they are capable of uh, blunting the rigidities of geographical specificities. I hope I made an attempt to answer your concern. Thank you for your patience.